Hello everybody, I'm Brother Waite, and if you're new to this channel, uh, I love studying the last seven years of this age. Hallelujah. Been doing it now for uh, uh, almost ten years. Um, what I want to do today, we need to discuss this because there's a little bit of confusion going on in the church about when are the saints that Father considers his family and who he wants to live for forever with him and his son Jesus, um, when do they get resurrected? Do they get resurrected uh, when those who abide in Christ, right? John chapter 6, when, when we, the church, get resurrected to life at the seventh bowl, last day of this age, is that when they get resurrected too, or do they get resurrected at the great white throne judgment? There's a lot of confusion going on. So let's clear it up today. Hallelujah. Now, where must we start this discussion? John chapter 6. Turn with me in your Bibles. I know you got them with you. To John chapter 6. We're going to look at just three verses in John 6. Verse 39. This is the will of the Father who sent me. That of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. All that Father has given me. So the question is, right there, who's the all? Is it primarily who we read about in this chapter, right? Those who Father gives to Jesus during these last 2,000 years? I mean, is that what we're talking about here? Or does the all encompass also people from the first 4,000 years, right? From Adam to Jesus' first coming. Now we've been 2,000 years almost since his first coming. So you get my point. You get what this is about. Does the resurrection to life on the last day when Jesus appears in glory above Zion at the seventh bowl pouring, does that not only include those who abide in Christ, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the last 2,000 years, but does it also encompass family members of God who look forward to the day of the Messiah? They just didn't know his name. And Father kept them written in his book, uh, the Book of Life. Yes, I'm talking about the book of life being around for 6,000 years, not just 2,000 years. I have the verses to prove it. But, um, yeah, we're looking at three verses to start this study in John chapter 6. Who is the all? Is all just the last 2,000 years or all encompasses the last 6,000 years? That was verse 39. Let's look at 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay? So we're talking about people who honor the words of Jesus, right? Who believe in his shed blood on the cross to atone for their sins, right? They believe in his words. Um, they have faith that he was raised from the dead. After three days, on the third day, hallelujah. Um, so if you were to just read verse 54, it sounds like, okay, those who get raised up at the last day are those from the last 2,000 years. But don't forget about all that Father has given me in verse 39. Could that all encompass more than just those who uh, have been uh, around and who abide in Christ the last 2,000 years. Now, the third verse I want to look at in John 6 for this study is 65. Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Right? The Ancient of Days, Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah. Uh, granted to him by Father. So that's what we're looking at. What does the all mean? 2,000 years, 6,000 years. Who's going to be shoulder to shoulder with you uh, on white horses in the clouds when we meet our Lord in the air at the seventh bowl? Or do those folks from the first 4,000 years have to wait until after the millennium? Good question, huh? Many of you know the answer. Some of you do not. 
And I'll tell you this, from what I've seen on YouTube lately of some well-known shepherds, I think what they're trying to say, based on what I heard, is they don't want to touch uh, the resurrection to life of those family members of God from the first 4,000 years. They don't want to talk about it. They just want to focus on those who abide in Christ, who eat his flesh, who drink his blood, who consume his word, to have faith in his uh, crucifixion and his resurrection. And they don't want to talk about those from the first 4,000 years. And when they do, some of them push it off into the great white throne judgment. That's what this study is about. So that's John 6. We looked at three verses. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12. What are we looking for? Well, we're going to the Old Testament right now, and we're looking for verses about the resurrection to life in the Old Testament. Okay? Now you might say, well, you're going to the Old Testament, but it's talking about um, the, the future seventh bowl glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. And I say, you're exactly right. In fact, that proves my point. Okay? Stick with me. Daniel chapter 12. Let's, we're not going to read the whole chapter. You need to on your own. Let's start with verse 1b, second part of verse 1. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as shall never, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time, and that and at that time your people shall be delivered. Your people Israel shall be delivered. Okay? You might say, well, delivered doesn't necessarily mean resurrection to life. It could just mean the strengthening of the one-third of Israel that remains alive. And you're exactly correct. Okay? But keep reading. Let's, oh, the time of trouble is talking about the future last two to three years of this age. Called the day of the Lord of hosts. When judgment comes upon the earth, beginning with the house of God, Israel. Father will make a determination at the end of the fifth seal period to, uh, to see if Father has to bring the promised curse of the Song of Moses. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, Deuteronomy 32. Okay, uh, He's going to give them uh, the first year and some days of Elijah and Moses. Um, good counsel for 42 months and testifying and witnessing. Um, he's going to give them the first year and some days of that, says uh, Isaiah 32, 10, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 8, 4. And, they'll, and then Father will make the decision. Did they repent so I can relent or do I have to bring the curse? And if Father brings the curse, it affects the whole world, starting with Israel. It's most likely what's going to happen. Um, let's keep reading. Everyone who is found written in the book. Okay, who gets delivered? Everyone who is found written in the book. Does that have anything to do with those who have died coming back to life because their name is in the book? Of course. Why else would their name be in the book? They may have died 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. We're talking about those who have died in the past. When the book of life, right, is opened up in heaven, and it's time to mount white horses and come back. Roll call! Fall in! Right? Who's in the book? Right? Platoons, squads, form up, let's go! It's time to ride. Uh, in fact, verse 2 proves it. And in many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So, that's the subject of what we're talking about here. Names written in the book of life. Those are the ones who shall, be, uh, shall have uh, their body resurrected to a new, immortal, incorruptible body from your people. Right? Okay, let's look at when that happens. Well, we don't have to go outside of this chapter to find out when this resurrection to life of old Testament saints whose names are in the book, right? We don't have to go outside of this chapter. You just simply look at the last three verses of this chapter to get the when. That's right. That's why we're doing this study. Is it the great white throne judgment? Is it the second coming of Jesus Christ on the last day of this age at the seventh bowl, not the first seal? Hallelujah. Get it right. Get it right. This is important. Okay. Let's read verses 11, 12, and 13 of Daniel 12 to find out when... This resurrection mentioned in uh, 
verse 2 is going to happen. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, that's at the Syrian Antichrist uh, revealing to the world at the fifth seal, when he goes into the temple explained uh, in Daniel 11, the previous chapter, as well as uh, in places like Matthew 24, Jesus warns about it. When you see, right, abomination of desolation, you start counting. One, day two, day three, right? Here you go. This, this isn't me telling you this. This is uh, your beloved. You need to count. You're going to be here. Wake up. You're going to be here. Don't let anyone tell you you're out of here. You ain't going nowhere till Jesus comes. He appears in glory on the last day with your reward to give you your rest. Crown of righteousness, okay? You got to wait patiently, says Revelation 12, 14. Still waiting, still waiting. You're waiting until when? Revelation 14, 14. That's how long you got to wait. This is how many days from the fifth seal event. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Is that the resurrection to life? Nope, but close. Well, what is day 1290? The second most important verse, uh, or the second most important event of the entire last seven years of the age. Number two, second most important event, day 1290. Doesn't get talked about en enough. Well, what is it? Go to Daniel 7, read verses 21 through 27. Boom, you got your answer. That's the seventh trumpet blast. By the seventh angel, two witnesses arise from the dead, Elijah and probably Moses. Why Moses? Besides the fact that he was in the, the vision of the transfiguration. Why Moses? Because he was there when the oath was signed. He was there when the oath was uttered, given, spoken. And it, the forefathers were told, this also goes for your descendants. That's in the word of God, too. It's not just on you forefathers. Okay? You got it? That's why it's probably going to be Moses. Yes, I get excited about this stuff. Hallelujah. So, that's day 1290. Father, the Ancient of Days has reached a verdict in favor of the saints of the Most High God. And they shall be given the kingdom. At the seventh trumpet? Nope. Why? Because we got to wait till the nations have gathered to Jerusalem. Jesus isn't going to go too far in chasing them down. Oh, you come to me. I'm going to judge you. Hurry up and get here. I want to go get my bride. I want to save the remnant in Jerusalem. Let's go. Come on, hurry up. So we're going to shorten the days a little bit. What is the no longer than date that the Lord gives you so you have faith? And it'll give you strength, a no longer than date after the fifth seal, that Jesus will come. It's the day between 1290 and what? Uh, verse 12 is your answer. Daniel 12, 12 gives you the answer of the no longer than date. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. What happens then? Read verse 13. But you go your way till the end. That's when the end comes. The appointed time of the end is the last two to three years of the age that climax with the end. The day Jesus comes to judge the world. Hallelujah! But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Oh, you prophet Daniel. Right? You Old Testament man, you from the first 4,000 years. You're going to get resurrected. What a coincidence, the same time as the church gets resurrected. The last day of this age, which is day 1335 or less. So, it, because of Matthew 24, 22, the Lord's going to shorten these days for the sake of the elect, right? Or there'd be nobody left in Jerusalem to come and save. The siege of Jerusalem is going to be that bad. So, between day 1290... While the nations are gathering and fathers pouring out the, the monkey pox or whatever on the beast kingdom, all those who take the mark of the Assyrian, they're going to be crawling like a snake, like the spirit of their father, the devil. They're going to be uh, having these loathsome sores on them during this six-week period. That'll be shortened for the sake of the elect. So that's the no longer than date of the resurrection to life. 
That's when Daniel gets resurrected. Same time as the church. Church doesn't get resurrected to life at the first seal, the fifth seal, the sixth seal, the first trumpet. They get resurrected to life at the end. The appointed time of the end, the end of the appointed time of the end. Hallelujah. On the last day, John chapter 6. Don't you remember reading it? Hallelujah. Now, in reference to more verses that talk about Old Testament saints participating in the last day resurrection to life, let's go to Hosea chapter 6. One of, it's the very next book found in the Bible, found in the Old Testament. Just turn a few pages, go to Hosea 6, verses 1 through 3. It tells you when Jesus is going to come. I repeat, it tells us when Jesus is going to come. Does it come from me? Let's read it. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. Is this the Gentile church making this statement around the future time of the seventh trumpet blast? Right just before Jesus comes, towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. They're trying to renew each other's strength. We just have a few more days to hold out, and this will be spoken. This is talking about the future siege of Jerusalem. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. Is this talking about the delivery of Daniel 12 in the previous book of the Bible? Yes, which includes strengthening of those who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, but they're written in the book. Father wants them to enter the kingdom, and they'll become very, uh, they will very much abide in Christ during the millennium. Millions of people and thousands of Israelis will enter the millennial reign of Christ. Now, these who enter and stay in their corruptible body during the millennium will get judged at the great white throne judgment too. Okay? Father will make a determination. But if he wants them to enter his kingdom alive in their mortal body, make lots of beautiful babies, and then die, soul go to heaven and await the great white throne judgment, then he will, and that's what he tells us in his word that he will do. Here we are in Hosea 6, first three verses, talking about the return of Christ, the Messiah, and it tells you when he's coming. We just saw in Daniel 12 when he's coming. It's a six-week window following the fifth seal abomination of desolation event, which is less than 77 months from the first seal, says Daniel 8, verses uh, 23 through 25. Actually, the whole chapter. Okay? 2300 day countdown starting at the first seal. God is good. Jesus has surely told us all things beforehand. Mark 13, 23. Six week window. I'm sorry you haven't been taught that before. Forgive me, but don't think I'm lying to you because I'm reading it, reading it to you. So, verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. This is talking about the same delivery, the same event at the seventh bowl that Daniel 12, 2 is talking about. Daniel 12, 1 is talking about. Okay, same event, same delivery. All right? Same birth. Hallelujah. When? After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. That we may live in his sight. He's here. He's been seen. Glory. Glory of his majesty. He's here. The king is here. Live in his sight. Either in a mortal or an incorruptible body. And don't say, well, the incorruptible bodies are those of the Gentile church. Or those of the church. No. Oh, no. Hallelujah. Uh, so, what does it mean after two days? Well, if you go to Matthew 20 and you read the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, you find out that a value of a one year, a value of one day of labors in Father's vineyard is worth one denarius. I didn't tell you that. Your beloved told you that. Matthew 20, parable of the laborers in the vineyard. One denarius. 
Then he expects us to go over to Luke 10 and, and read about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he goes, Good Samaritan gives the innkeeper two denarii. I'm coming back. Take care of this man. If I owe you anything more, I'll pay you when I get back. I need you to continue my work. Heal, strengthen, restore. All right? Work. Take care of this person. Bring them back. Restoration of health, life. I'll be back if I owe you any more. But here, this should do until I come back. I'm paraphrasing the parable of the Good Samaritan. But your beloved wanted to make sure you knew here's two denarii. Why? Because that means two days of labor in Father's vineyard. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years. Hallelujah. That tells me. It may tell you something different. Me? Oh, I'm coming back after 2,000 years. You want to know when the seventh bowl is coming? Count 2,000 years after I came the first time. Now, could I be wrong? I guess. I'm a man. I'm human. But you turn on your TV, right? What does it say? I was right. So something to think about. I'm not the one that made sure you knew that the Good Samaritan gave the innkeeper two denarii. You think that's a coincidence? No. He's pointing you to Hosea 6. Hallelujah! Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth at the seventh bowl is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Anytime you're reading about prophetic passages and you see the word established, that's talking about established delivery. Who's going to enter my kingdom? Establishment of the kingdom. Who's going to enter it in a corruptible body? Who's going to enter it in an incorruptible body? Hallelujah. Especially when it comes to my people, Israel. All right. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 26. I don't believe we've hit on that yet. I think we went John 6, Daniel 12, Hosea 6. Now let's go to Isaiah 26. And I also can't remember if we highlighted John 6, 66. I don't think we did. John 6, 66 is a good example of the falling away during our Lord's first coming. During those uh, three and a half years, the falling away, it helps you understand what's meant by falling away at his second coming in regards to the taking the mark and of the beast and bowing before this Assyrian. Okay, John 6, 66. Pretty cool. I don't think we talked about it when we were reading John 6. Now we're in Isaiah 66. Excuse me, Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26 is a real important passage when you're trying to figure out if Old Testament saints are going to get resurrected, when does it happen? Isaiah 26 tells you when it's going to happen. Isaiah 26 talks about the subject of the chapter, and it's verse 19. Let's go to Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. And there's even a little footnote right here that says Daniel 12, 2. Right? In case you don't believe me. Which, why would you? Um, that's the subject of the whole chapter. Isaiah 24 is talking about the same thing. So is most of the chapters before and after. But go to verse 9 and you get the when. Verse 19 of Isaiah 26 was the subject. Right? Old Testament saints. When are they going to get resurrected? Um, verse 9 is the when. With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. When your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn finally, I'm throwing in the finally, righteousness. Hallelujah. When your judgments are in the earth. That's Daniel 12, uh, 1, Daniel 12, 1, time of Jacob's trouble. Seven trumpet judgments, contents of the scroll, when Father performs the intents of his heart. Judgment begins at the house of God. Then Jesus comes and judges the nations. Hallelujah, and the dead, and the living. That's the when, the time of Jacob's trouble, at the climax, Right? That is when the dead shall live. 
And of course, the subject here in the Old Testament, um, it definitely includes the Old Testament saints, if not all 6,000 years. Okay, but you got the when. You got the when here. You got the when in Hosea 6. You got the when in um, Daniel 12. To, to talk more about the resurrection to life of Old Testament saints and the when, let's go to jo Job chapter 14. When's the last time you've been to Job? Job 14 is Revelation 14's resurrection to life. Did you know the resurrection to life and the rapture of those who are alive and remain are in Revelation 14? They are verses 14 through 16. And then verses 17 through 20, or seven, yeah, 17 through 20, that is the burning of the tares as part of judgment. That's the trampling of the tares. That's the cutting off from the living, all of those who uh, are, took the mark of the beast and are enemies and adversaries of Jesus Christ and his father, Yahweh, the God of Jacob. Are you an enemy of the God of Jacob? Are you an enemy of Jesus? Hope not. Uh, Job 14, let's go there. And Job 14 is Revelation 14's resurrection to life. We're going to look at Job 14, verse, uh, verses 13 through 17. Job, where are you at? 14. All right, Job 14, verses 13 through 17. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past. Hide me in the grave and un con would conceal me until your wrath is past. When your judgments are in the earth. Right? Isaiah 26, 9. Here we are in Job 14, 13. When is your wrath is past? Well, that's talking about Father dealing with his people throughout the millenniums throughout the centuries, excuse me. No, it's not. This is talking about the future day of the Lord of hosts, just like all the other passages are. There's only one, right? Time that climaxes with the resurrection to life. And it is um, at the seventh bowl last day following the time of Jacob's trouble. Right, following the 42 months of war on Christianity by Satan. That's what that's talking about. Let's read on. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait. That's what you're told in Revelation 14, 12. Just before the resurrection to life. I hope you're still waiting. I hope you're still waiting. Have you given up yet? Have you been overtaken by Satan yet? Have you taken his mark? Have you bowed before his image? Are you now the walking dead, or have, are you waiting patiently on me? Hallelujah. Oh, what an aroma that's going to be, suffering for the Lord. Hallelujah. Till my, I will wait, till, I will wait, till my change comes. Job 14, 14. Look how easy the Lord makes that. To remember, Job 14, 14 is Revelation, 14, 14 is Zechariah 14, his Isaiah 14. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah! Amen. When does Jesus come? We're not supposed to know the day and the hour. We're told the hour. It's the, it's the evening time, twilight, time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, just like King David. When he plundered the Amalekites and recovered all. 1 Samuel 30, verse 17. Isaiah 17, verse 14. Zechariah 14, verse 7. That's when your Lord is going to come. Hallelujah. At evening time, twilight, it shall be light. The glory of the Lord. All right. Uh, verse 15. You shall call and I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. You shall call and I will answer you, right? You shall desire. The books are being opened. For now you number my steps, but do not watch over my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag and you cover my iniquity. When is the, my people going to be delivered? Some to eat in, uh, incorruptible flesh, some not. Right there. When the, the day when the change comes. Hallelujah. The day... 
at the seventh bowl return of Jesus Christ, when the punishment, the curse, punishment of the curse of the Song of Moses is complete, Jesus uh, has now paid the price for Yisrael, the remnant of Israel, one third. Hallelujah. Did you know that? I didn't say to eternal life. Father will make that determination to great white throne judgment. But that one third of Israel that are written in the books that shall remain alive and enter the kingdom of God and replenish it because they're still mortals. Am I getting too deep? All right, two more passages to end this lesson. Zechariah 9, verses 13 and 14. How about that? Zechariah 9, another famous return of Jesus passage in the Old Testament. Zechariah 9. There we go. All right. Verse 13 and 14. Remember, we're talking about resurrection to life of those from the first 4,000 years. Uh, For I have bent Judah my bow, fitted the bow of Ephraim. Make sure I got the right passage. And raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. Remember, this is talking about the return of Jesus. Then the Lord will be seen over them. There you go. In his, to live in his sight. And his arrow will go forth like lightning. Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. The Lord will blow the trumpet. Matthew 24, and go with whirlwinds from the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them. Hallelujah. He'll resurrect to, uh, to life whoever Father has written in his book and wants to give a new immortal body to. Uh, again, I'm going through these passages about the resurrection to life of those who lived during the first 4,000 years, proving to you that it'll happen at the same time as the church gets resurrected because it's all that Father has given to Jesus he shall raise up on the last day. Not just those who consume his his words and commandments of the New Testament during the last 2,000 years. It also includes the family of God from the entire 6,000 year period. Okay? Why am I stressing this? Because I've seen too many people lately not talk about them when they're talking about the resurrection to life. Okay, to end this, Micah 4.13. Micah 4 is a powerful, powerful return of Jesus passage. I mean, you want, you want to know what the kingdom, the name, the official name of the kingdom of God is? It's right there in Micah 4. Hallelujah. You want to read about Ezekiel 37's dry bones to know whether they're actually being resurrected back to life? Or is it just, or does Ezekiel 37 just mean that Father is going to strengthen those Israelis who, who are alive at the end of the coming war? Right, and help them go out and have great victory over their enemies and adversaries. Oh no, we're talking about a resurrection to life as well as the strengthening of the mortals. Uh, I just had Micah and I lost it. Okay, I'm still looking for Micah 4. Uh, There it is. Mike the four. We're going to start with verse 13. How about that? We've been reading 13 and 14 a lot. Micah 4 verse 13. You know what? We're going to start reading in verse 8 because that's where you get the official name of the kingdom of God. So we're going to start in verse 8. Uh, and you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. That's the name. Keep reading. To you shall it come. What? What comes when Jesus comes? The kingdom. Hallelujah. To you shall it come. Even the former dominion shall come. Right? To who? To the Gentile church. No! You're grafted onto them. How many times did Paul have to tell you that? To you shall it come. Who? Who's the you? Daughter of Zion. 
Even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Oh, Micah 4 is not a history lesson. Now watch. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? Right? Talking about what? The time of delivery, the time of Jacob's trouble. They're being purged. Two-thirds of Israel's about to die. Zechariah 13, verses 7 through 9. It's not my... I don't glory in saying that. It's sad. But it's true. You've got to read the Word of God. Has your counselor perished for pangs have seized you like a woman in labor? Right? Time of Jacob's trouble. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pangs. For now you shall go forth from the city, you shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go there. You shall be delivered, for the Lord will redeem you from the hands of of your enemies is that now we got to stop when it's mentioning Babylon is it talking about Babylon of the past or is it talking about Babylon of Revelation 18 that's real important let's keep reading find out are we talking about King Nebuchadnezzar here in Micah 4 or are we talking about Babylon of Revelation 18 during the last days when Assyria and Babylon hook up with many others and become uh, the fourth beast, right? That tramples fiercely, right? The Babylon of Isaiah 13 and 14, the Babylon of Jeremiah 50 and 51. Which Babylon, you know, are we talking about? You shall dwell in the field, and to Babylon you shall go. There you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now also many nations have gathered against you. This is talking about Joel 3, Zephaniah 3. Zephaniah 3, Joel 3, a sixth bowl of Revelation chapter 16, gathering of the nations to Armageddon, to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's what this is talking about. You don't believe me? Keep reading. Who say, let her be defiled and let our eye look upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel. For he will gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Isaiah 27, 12. Hallelujah. The harvest of Revelation 14. The threshing of Revelation 18. This is it. And then we have the resurrection to life of Ezekiel 37, Daniel 12, Hosea 6, right? You're going to be part of Yisrael. That you're going to be part, a member of the kingdom of, of the daughters of Zion, Jerusalem. Watch, verse 13. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. I will make your horn iron. I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples. I will consecrate their gain to the Lord and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. And we even have footnotes here from the New King James Version, folks, in verse 13. Daniel 2.44. What in the world is Daniel 2.44? When Jesus Christ of Nazareth comes as one like the Son of Man, and he crushes and breaks in pieces the statue, right? Hallelujah! The kingdom of Babylon of the last days, Right? They were right when they put that footnote there. I was right when I told you that's the subject of Micah 4. Future Babylon. Hallelujah. This is the beat in pieces of Jeremiah 51. Don't let anyone tell you that Jeremiah 51 isn't the return of Jesus Christ and the resurrection to life. Hallelujah. I will consecrate their gain to the Lord and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. That is the plundering like a thief of Jesus Christ of Nazareth in Revelation uh, 19, just like his grandpa King David did in uh, 1 Samuel 30 and recovered all that belonged to him. Hallelujah. That is the marriage supper of the Lamb of Ezekiel 39, by the way. That's a whole other lesson. Brothers and sisters, um, I got some verses here for you. I want you to write down real quick. I've proven my point about when the resurrection to life is of those from the first 4,000 years. But what I want to do right now is give you a series of verses that talk about 
um, father writing names in his book. And these passages, uh, most of these passages are in the Old Testament. And I say this because a lot of people don't equate the book of life prior to Jesus' first coming. The father was writing names in it during the, last, uh, the first 4,000 years. Here you go. Write them down. Uh, Exodus 32, verses 32 through 33. Psalm 9, verse 5. Psalm 69, verse 28. Psalm 109, verse 13. Isaiah 44, verse 22. Isaiah 43, verse 25. Jeremiah 18, verse 23. And now a couple uh, New Testament passages, Acts 3, verse 19, and Revelation 3, 5. Brothers and sisters, if you were ever a little bit confused about uh, John 6, and what does it mean, all that Father has given to Jesus, he shall raise on the last day, is that talking about people from the first 4,000 years too, that Father wrote in his book, the book of life? In other words, the book of life has been around for 6,000 years, having names written in them that they can be blotted out if Father didn't send you his spirit and you fall away from Jesus or you fall away from Messiah or you fall away from Yahweh, right, during the first 4,000 years. So let there never be confusion again about who's the all of John 6 and who's getting resurrected to life when Jesus appears on the last day and resurrects to life those whose names are written in the book. And he also catches up those who are alive and remain. And if we're alive, we join them in the air at Jesus' coming. And we don't go to heaven, we ride. And it's time to attack, just like his grandpa did in 1 Samuel 30, verse 17. Brothers and sisters, if you're confused about the rapture, and you don't like what you just heard, don't forget what the lesson was, and hopefully there's no confusion about who gets resurrected to life at the seventh bowl. Glorious appearing of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. I hope to see you again. If you got any questions, you know what to do. Like, subscribe. I'll see you again soon. God bless.